What's up guys, today we're going to be going over what do you meme and his opinions on the Black Lives Matter movement. And before we get into that, I need to go ahead and let you guys know this is going to be a collaboration episode, but I'm not going to introduce you to them yet. You're going to have to actually sit through my intro first. Sucks to be you, bye! Alright, now that that's out of the way, thank you guys for sitting through that as you usually do. If you are new to the channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, and go ahead and hit the bell notification icon, as that will help you see new episodes when they come out. If you happen to not be on my channel because this is a collaboration one, then you should probably do that anyway. If you're watching this on my channel, then you should probably go and see the channel of my guest, Nervardia. Hi everyone, my name is Meredith, my channel is Nervardia, and I do a whole heap of things, mainly on science atheism that sort of stuff so please come check me out if you haven't seen me or heard of me before and hit the like and subscribe button as well now we have to get into the unfortunate side of things which is the video we're going to be going over i've never seen so much confusion as i have in the last few months between christians and how they should think about race and black lives matter now obviously part of the tension has to do with politics and how black lives matter is usually considered to be a leftist movement and christians are usually on the way other end of the spectrum so one of the problems i have with this is he's putting it as a left versus right problem. It's not actually a left versus right thing. It's not conservative versus whatever. It's a progressive movement. You can be a conservative and still support Black Lives Matter. So I'd say while there are more people on the left who generally agree with certain things that BLM stands for, the idea that please do not shoot an inordinate amount of people in the United States as police officers who are supposed to serve and protect us has become a political issue is baffling to me. In the last few months, I've seen a lot of Christians who have been looking for a way to affirm their conviction that black people matter just as much as everyone else and deserve equality and fairness. But at the same time, they also feel uncomfortable with the organization Black Lives Matter and what they stand for. Well, as it turns out, it's not very hard to affirm your belief in a particular ideology and not support an adjacent organization. Where Black Lives Matter is concerned, it's really even hard to call a lot of it an organization. Black Lives Matter exists as an ideology and also separately as 16 different chapters between the United States and Canada. Let me go ahead and give a comparison for you so that maybe you'll understand where I'm coming from. I am an atheist, but there are atheist organizations that do not represent me, and I am not affiliated with them. Black Lives Matter is the exact same way. I'm sure that for what do you mean here, there are plenty of Christian organizations that he's not affiliated with and do not represent him, and yet he is still perfectly fine identifying as his particular flavor of popsicle Christian. And here's a quick example of why. So if you haven't heard, it appears that someone leaked some Google documents from the Black Lives Matter organization, and these documents seem to be some sort of curriculum that's been created by the organization in order to teach children from early childhood, through middle school, all the way through high school, and it's supposed to teach them how to think about race and equality. Well, I have to say, at least he put a link. That makes our lives a lot better. But also, this kind of reminds me of something that's come out in Australia a few years ago that was absolutely 100% a lot of people did not like it and it was called the safe schools program and it was designed to stop bullying of the lgbtqia plus people and unfortunately um it got shut down because of r rhetoric such as we're gonna make kids to go gay or we're gonna force kids to learn how to have sex or whatever and it was absolutely nothing like that this program sounds similar to me where they're saying we should try and stop people from being racist but apparently that's a bad thing. In fact, actually, let me go ahead and compare a curriculum like this to something that maybe what do you mean can understand a little better. If you are a child growing up in school in the United States where we have a separation of church and state, and you happen to discover that you're a Christian. If you, as a child, discover that you're a Christian and want to research more about this, curriculums for Christian education exist for you to utilize to learn more about your Christianity. The existence of those curriculums doesn't mean that they're suddenly going to become mandatory teaching in schools. The existence of those curriculums doesn't suddenly mean that we're going to have this zeitgeist where all schools now have to teach Christian curriculums. Thank goodness. I don't want to deal with any more creationists than we already have to deal with today. 
Tell me about it. I'm a science communicator. Now, I don't know if this material is going to be mandatory material for all schools, and by next year, it's going to be put in all of our school systems. I wouldn't doubt it if so. Again, this is not something that's going to be put in our school systems. I don't see how the existence of supplementary material evades you unless the only way you could speak is in alarmism. At this point, I don't have that information. As I read through some of these documents, my first thought was just how blatantly logically inconsistent these documents were when they talked about equality. In their early education, kid-friendly guide for teaching kids, we read about the language that they use when they try to coach the teachers into teaching their kids about transgender affirmation. They tell their teachers to say something like this. Everybody has the right to choose their own gender by listening to their own heart and mind. Everyone gets to choose if they are a girl, a boy, or both, or neither, or something else, and no one else gets to choose for them. According to the organization, the way that I'm supposed to come to know who or what I am is by listening to my heart. Yes, generally speaking, the way that most functional human beings come to know aspects about themselves is through self-reflection. If you're upset that we're teaching children to engage in self-reflection, then maybe you need to engage in some self-reflection. Also, it's been shown that children actually start to identify their gender by ages five to six, but that does become a little bit more flexible with age. And if my heart tells me that I'm neither a boy or a girl and I'm really something else altogether, like a Lego, then I conclude myself to be that because I'm whatever I feel like I am. So what you're engaging in right now is the fallacy of category error. A Lego is an inanimate object, and even under the ideas of social construction of gender, we have the social construction of a Lego as an inanimate object. A person cannot be a Lego because we have identified socially that a Lego is categorically separate than a human being. If we are to actually remain in the correct category, what genders do we recognize as a society? Well, right now, just as a society on the whole, we recognize a bimodal spectrum of genders, male, female, and then certain androgynous things that happen to fall in between. Whatever name or label you put on those things is up to you. It's your identity. But none of that's going to be a Lego brick. That's nonsensical. You're engaging in absurdism to make a very flaccid point. Yeah, I can't believe he made the Lego joke. Like, that was bad five years ago. It's bad then, it's bad now, and he honestly should be ashamed of himself. Now, first off, if you can be a boy and a girl at the same time and in the same sense as they seem to say above, then the words boy and girl can't mean anything, at least in not any sort of meaningful sense, since you can't be a boy and a girl at the same time without a contradiction. So actually, no, when we accept that boy and girl are societally built definitions, these things are not necessarily contradictory. These things are only contradictory if you have a very narrow scope on what gender is. For instance, if you accept the identification process where gender is concerned, then we have to take a look at someone who is, say, gender fluid. If this person identifies with male characteristics, and I'll go ahead and throw in their experiences dysphoria when they are not performing these male characteristics, then this person is, for that amount of time, male. However, if this person two weeks from now, because they are gender fluid and this changes for them, identifies with female and all of the male characteristics they were building up over the last week start to cause them to suffer dysphoria. Now, this is somebody who is going to identify as female. They embody both male and female characteristics, mannerisms, performative traits, and depending on the person, might even biologically exemplify these things. There are more chromosomal variations than just XX and XY. Many of these aspects can be embodied by a single individual, and they are only contradictory if you engage in reductionism. So this guy clearly hasn't heard of non-binary or gender fluid people, as you mentioned earlier, but you know, you've also got the biological things such as hermaphrodites. They have the genitalia of both male and female sexes. Even when we look at biology, we still find that aspects of male and female people exist in a bimodal spectrum. There are people who have many biological aspects of males, but also happen to imbibe biological aspects of females and vice versa. If there is no contradiction, then those words don't really mean anything at all. So again, those words 
because their meaning is not what you're trying to assign them, they don't inherently have a contradiction. The meaning can be separate without having a contradiction. There are societal aspects of manhood and of womanhood that we agree on. Some of these things are performative, like, say, doing the laundry or doing the dishes or wearing makeup. A lot of those things, at least here in the States, are considered performatively female. So if a guy engages in them, are they doing a girl's duties? Well, no, those are things that there's no contradiction there of a guy doing things that are performatively female, at least as far as society is concerned. But even worse, did you catch that point there? They aren't just telling our children that they can decide how they feel and that can determine who they really are, but they're also saying that others have to accept it. So how you feel doesn't just determine who you are to yourself, but it also determines who you are to other people. Oh yeah, of course you should accept what people say. I mean, you're male and you say that you're male, but what if I disagreed with you? What if I thought that you were a woman? However, let's just take gender out of it. Like, you know, when somebody insists that they know something about you that you know is incorrect. For example, when somebody insists that you like something and you genuinely don't like it, they insist they know more about you than you yourself. It's kind of abusive actually. So if I were to engage in a conversation with you, I, as an outsider, think your name is Stephanie, therefore, it's Stephanie. The only person who can determine that is you. And by the way, your name falls in this category as well. Your parents named you by default because you didn't have the ability to select your own name. Whether or not you accept that once you're an adult and have full autonomy is entirely up to you, yourself. You don't want to identify with the name that your parents gave you? Then don't. You don't have to. And the only person who has the ability to change that is you. It doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what other people think. Given that logic, what's to stop Trump from becoming the first female black president next week? No, really, if he wakes up tomorrow and believes that he's a black woman, then according to the logic of the Black Lives Matter organization, not only would he be a black female, but the Black Lives Matter organization would have to accept it since no one can tell him otherwise, according to them. Gender and race are not the same thing. While we can agree that these things are both societally constructed, and I'll even be providing a link in the description to a source that shows how we've determined race over the years, it used to literally be just one random marshal going, Yep! He looks black enough! That's not how we do things now. Now, we engage in a process of self-identification. We've actually done this for several decades here in the United States. And yet, society has not yet fallen into total collapse through this method of self-identification. You know when you have the ability to scribble in that B instead of the W on the cards here in the United States uh, when, you're in, when you're signing out your census? Guess what? That's self-identification. Congratulations. You've already done it. You did it. Congratulations. 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 One of the problems with Trump suddenly self-identifying as a black woman, even taking away the race thing, is that there needs to be a lot of psychological evaluation through multiple professionals that can actually take years to happen for someone to actually be considered a trans person. Not all the time, but you know, often it it is required to just so we know that this person is not trying to pull the mickey. This isn't a flippant thing, and it's almost insulting to all the trans people who had a lot of difficulty getting their gender identity affirmed to just go, oh, tomorrow somebody will wake up and they think they're trans. Let's bring up another argument that a lot of conservative people and transphobic people don't often think about. Would people actually want to transition if it was easy? In a world where transitioning were easy, like incredibly easy, like you could just go to your doctor and go, hey, I need HRT. Uh, I'm probably gonna need surgery here in about a year. Uh, and, and is all that good? And the doctor said yes. And you just, woo, out the door, perfectly fine. And everybody accepted your identity immediately as soon as you realized what your identity was. People don't just do things when or because they're easy. People do hard things and difficult things all the time. Ergo, people transition right now, and it's incredibly difficult. Not everybody does things just because they're easy. Irregardless of the fact that it was incredibly easy for me to stuff a spoon into a jar of Nutella back there and eat 
an unhealthy amount of it this morning for breakfast. I didn't just do that because that was easy. I did it because it was both easy and also I was craving chocolate. I'm sure that there are plenty of people with jars of Nutella in their cabinets that do not routinely take spoons to them simply because it's easy. Usually it's because they are also craving chocolate and maybe they're sad, which same, I, I feel you. If Donald Trump wakes up tomorrow and wants to identify as a black woman, he will need to get psychological evaluation. And in that case, I kind of want him to do that. You know, the planet is on fire. They say, black women is the building of women-centered spaces free from sexism, misogyny, and male-centeredness. There are some people who think that women are less important than men. We know that all people are important and have the right to be safe and talk about their own feelings. Not to mention, they also talk about patriarchy. So you pointed to that point, but you didn't actually extrapolate on it. Um, you do know that the idea of egalitarianism means elevating people who are currently disenfranchised into a better state so that they can then be enfranchised into societal norms later. An example of equality versus egalitarianism. Equality is everybody has the same shot at this job. However, not everybody really has the same shot at that job. Because Michael over here, even if these are both black men, Michael has a name that could be prescribed to a white man or a black man. Tyrone over here has a name that we, at least here in the States, generally assume is a black name. We have actually done a few studies that show that black sounding names don't necessarily get viewed as often during the application process. Given that, what is needed here? Because equality is already here. We've already got it. They're working in the exact same system. But is it fair? Well, no, it's not fair. And if your response is to say, well, life's not fair, then the difference between me and you is that I want to actually improve the world and you're perfectly fine with the shithole you live in. So in a system like this, what do we need to do? Well, we probably need to create a system where people who are currently unemployed can receive some form of sustenance so that they can survive while they are searching for a job to make up for the fact that they might not be able to get a job due to unfair reasons, even though they exist in a society where all things are equal as far as the application process is concerned. That's the difference between egalitarianism and equality. Egalitarianism gives people a safety net. It can elevate people into a situation where they are better equipped to deal with society. Equality just throws everybody on the ground and says, have at it, regardless of the fact things might not necessarily work out for you. Finding it as a culture dominated and controlled by men's voices and perspectives. Well, if men become men and women become women based off of their thoughts that other people can't see, then there wouldn't be a possible way for Black Lives Matter to conclude that women are oppressed or that culture is dominated by men since we can't read minds. Um, we can't read minds, but one thing we can do, we can ask people how they identify, and usually people have no problem identifying with their birth sex. So yes, we can't read minds, but remember that point we made earlier about how we generally have the ability to ask people about their identity? I don't have to read your mind to figure out that you're male. I can just ask you, what are your pronouns? How do you identify? These are easy, non-intrusive ways of figuring out someone's identity. There's not a contradiction. You have to actually straw man the idea of gender into absurdism in order for there to be a contradiction here. We can all agree that we can't read minds, but the fact of the matter is that you expect us to think that we can read minds and then tell us that we're deficient in some way. That is not how it works. It's not how life is. If you don't know something, you should ask a question. There is nothing wrong with being asked, what is your preferred pronouns? Isn't this a clear case of the most hateful crime of assuming somebody's gender without asking them? Ah, yes, the did you just assume my gender joke. Another joke that probably should have died five years ago. But if I took this logic seriously, then there can't even be a Black Lives Matter organization. That logic also destroys the entire Black Lives Matter position. Oh, really? All right, just think about it. The concept that Black Lives Matter can only be true if there's something that makes someone black in the first place. But as we just saw above, the way that we come to know who or what we are is based on our own internal thoughts that other people can't see just by looking at us physically. However, there is one thing that I can determine when looking at you physically. And given that race is something that we determine societally as well, most people would agree that based on the amount of melanin in your skin, you are a person of color, as there is color present in your skin. Those are the criterion 
that we are using for race here. And they are also the criterion used for judgment by police officers when they engage in racial bias, regardless of self-identity. And the thing is, race and gender aren't the same thing. Unless you have, unless you undergo extensive tattooing or you have vitiligo, which is an autoimmune disease that attacks the color producing cells of your skin and hair, you cannot change the color of your skin. Unfortunately, people will judge you because of that. People can identify with a culture that is not of their heritage, but just like a non-passing trans person, people will still argue that you are a black person even if you don't identify as one. All of this is still predicated on the straw man that race factored into the self-identification process that Black Lives Matter is even talking about in their documents, which it wasn't. Even in the one you presented here, they talked expressly about gender. Your race doesn't factor into your gender. They're categorically separate things, but they're both socially constructed. Would you like to know something else that's socially constructed? Money. If the only way that we can tell what someone is is if they tell us because we can't read minds, then if that's the case, there could only be discrimination towards people who have already identified themselves to be black. Debunked. Then no, it's not. Bad joke is bad. Continue. The entire logic of the organization is a logical disaster that, if taken consistently, destroys the very thing that they're trying to establish. So the organization is fundamentally illogical and Christians are told to be lovers of truth and should be willing to follow the truth wherever it leads. Yeah, Christians are told to be lovers of truth because Christianity does not say a single lie ever at all. There's no contradictions whatsoever. No, nah, not one. Not at all. Mm -mm. No, I just, I honestly can't think of any. Also, within Christian literature, Jesus self-identifies as the way, the truth, and the life. And if Christians are taught to love Jesus, then yes, they are supposed to love truth. Because Jesus self-identified as the truth. And Christians had to take that self-identification at face value. This is one reason why Christians don't want to align with the organization Black Lives Matter. But second, the organization is also unbiblical. So, so if something is, um, if something is, um, bleh. if something is unbiblical, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you know, there's the whole how to kill your slaves legally and you know, what you should do to a woman who's been raped and not married and... Would you also like a short list of things in my office that are unbiblical? A bottle of Tabasco sauce. I have not seen this mentioned in the Bible whatsoever. This can of compressed air. I have not seen this mentioned in the Bible whatsoever. It's unbiblical. It's gotta go. My Nintendo 64 controller. This is very unbiblical. Video game systems aren't mentioned in the Bible at all. Oh, fuck it! Gotta go! Mason jars are not in the Bible. So it... I'm not throwing this one. Just a very short list of unbiblical things in my office. Something being unbiblical doesn't automatically make it bad. Except the Nintendo 64 controller. That thing is actually objectively horrible. If you pay attention to how they talk, they have plenty of unbiblical views that are incompatible with historic Christianity. And one of them is that they're calling for the destruction of the nuclear family, which we as Christians believe is a God-ordained union that in some ways mirrors the gospel. If people were to read the point that Black Lives Matter was making, they'd have a much better understanding of what their argument is. Black Villages is the disruption of Western nuclear family dynamics and a return to the collective village that takes care of each other. There are lots of different kinds of families. What makes a family is that it's people who take care of each other. Those people might be related or maybe they choose to be family together and to take care of each other. Sometimes when it's lots of families together, it can be called a village. I think it's very clear when you actually read through any of the literature that they're putting out here that phrases like the disruption of the nuclear family doesn't mean that you're destroying the nuclear family. You're simply trying to change the social zeitgeist. Right now, the social zeitgeist says that the nuclear family is the most stable model, period, and it is the best model for raising children. And right now, I would also have to grant that a lot of the data supports that too. But here's the funny thing. Usually people operate better as a familial unit when they have the support of their surrounding family. So if there are families for instance, not that any of this has ever happened, especially not in good Christian households, but if there are families who happen to be, say, homophobic, it would then be reasonable to assume that these families might not necessarily support their queer children. And then when these children 
uh, happen to find loving partners of their own, and then either through systems of in vitro, adoption, or whatever, create a family of their own. If they don't receive the support of their surrounding family, then no duh, the situation's going to be less stable, de facto. Polyamorous families are going to be less stable, as they generally do not receive the support of the rest of their family members. This is a pretty decently obvious cultural phenomenon to witness here in the States. So even though, yes, the data exists that says that the nuclear family model is in fact the most stable model, there are factors that have led to those conclusions. And here's the thing, we can change those factors by normalizing queer families, polyamorous families, and, as was once a thing that had to be done before, mixed race families. And also a large family group um, where a child lives with their parents but can reliably go from multiple households, it actually gives them a sense of security. So for example, I used to live near my grandmother and when my brother and sister would start having awful fights, creating effectively World War III, I was able to go and visit my grandmother until things decided to just calm down. If there's any form of disruption within the family, um, then these kids know that they've got somewhere to go to stay with an aunt or uncle or the next door neighbors or grandparents or whatever. And also these people give people, and also people give them an opportunity to give their parents a break. So then that, per then the couple, the mother and the father, have an evening to themselves and reducing the overall stress of the household. So a village in a way is even a better form of the nuclear family. And I can't see why he's so upset about the tearing down of the nuclear family, especially since in biblical times, a man was able to have multiple wives. It should also probably be noted that while it may take a village to raise a child, if you're a particularly talented necromancer, it might take a child to raise a village. This is in direct contrast to a historic Christian view of marriage. Their ideology is also based on critical race theory and Marxism, and they have a lot of aspects that Christians don't feel comfortable accepting. Now, there's plenty more examples, but I think at this point, you pretty much get my point. I'm sure they get your point because what you're trying to do is preach to the choir. You're talking to an audience that likely already doesn't accept things like Marxism, but if they could actually articulate why, I might be impressed. And if they could articulate why without straw manning, I'd be equally impressed. You're speaking to an audience that has a perception of these ideas, then you can automatically dismiss them immediately without actually engaging with the topics or engaging with the literature. Now, if you have other videos where you've done this, I don't know, because you didn't link them in the description. But personally, I don't actually get his point because he's only given, what, two or three different reasons that Christians shouldn't like the BLM movement. It was trans issues, gender dynamics, and tearing down the nuclear family. And of course he makes the vague mention of critical race theory and Marxism and he doesn't give any examples of them and he makes the claims, but he doesn't back them up. And honestly, why are these so bad? A lot of Christians might actually agree with those points that he wanted to debunk. If this material is forced on our kids this year or next year, we don't have any problem with them teaching our kids that all lives are equal. But the problem is it teaches much, much more than that. Not only does the material train our kids to think illogically by training them to come to conclusions about reality in the exact wrong way. Y you're in a death cult. Like the whole thing about Christianity is worshiping a guy who died brutally and then trying to work the entire life to die and be with him for the rest of eternity. Like Christianity also uses the claim that God made everything and then that's how we got here and completely rejects evolution because it goes against the Christian worldview. And you're trying to say that giving people a way to think outside of the box is illogical and you you're, you're using the Bible to say you're, they're wrong? What? Again, I think a lot of this stems from the fact that Christians love truth in the sense that Jesus called himself truth and they love Jesus. And that's about the extent of it. Not all Christians, mind you. I should probably add in that disclaimer there. Not all Christians are like this. I know several logical yes. Christians who don't do things like engage in science denialism, but there are certain ones. Uh, Ken Ham, Kent Hovind, and they're 
constituents specifically mm. who engage in a lot of this yeah what's the saying in matthew 7 3 why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own the bible engaging in the two quoque fallacy since job but it smuggles in all kinds of other baggage that's not only at odds with christianity but in my opinion will only make our society a worse place so hang on People rejecting unjust and damaging norms will make our society worse? Like demanding equality amongst the genders, demanding people don't get killed due to the color of their skin, being more accepting of other people's sexual, like that, that is going to make our society worse rather than, hey, let's go kill all the gays. So this doesn't mean that Christians reject everything that Black Lives Matter says and stands for, but it also doesn't mean that Christians can accept these things. But even though Christians want to support the sentiment that Black Lives Matter, we also don't want to take on all of the other ideological baggage associated with the Black Lives Matter organization. So this is why Christians find themselves in the awkward position of wanting to affirm the slogan, but aren't able to support it because that would lead people to assume that they also affirm the ideology and the behavior of the organization. Boy, do you remember the conversations we had way earlier in the video about self-identity? Boy, wouldn't it be weird if there was a convenient mechanism by which we could actually affirm that we agree with a particular ideology or identify with something in particular without taking on all the baggage that comes with it? Gee, almost as if some of the stuff that's being talked about in the Black Lives Matter documentation about identifying with the gender, but not necessarily taking all of the gendered norms that come with it. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you know how to cook clean and sew. Just because I'm a man doesn't mean I know how to change a tire or grill. Just because you identify with a particular gender doesn't mean you have to take on all the baggage of that gender, all these societal expectations of that gender. The exact same concept exists where things like Black Lives Matter is concerned. So if you had just engaged in this using some of the logic presented to you in the literature you're attempting to debunk, you actually wouldn't be at a crossroads right now. Holy shit. So that's why I decided to start the hashtag Black Lives Matter to Christ and also created some t-shirts for Christians if they want to show support for the phrase, but also distinguish themselves from the organization. So now we get into what the whole video is actually about it wasn't just i just want to sort out some things that the black lives matter movement is saying that i don't necessarily agree with but still point out that i think that black lives do in fact matter this is an advertisement for a merch line yes that's just not at all immoral at all everyone join my patreon yes now that i'm criticizing him about his merch i'm gonna go ahead and say that based on the opinions i've seen in this video if he wants to go fuck himself he can actually do so by following the link in the description of ddlgplayground.com using coupon code slash service to get 10% off of whatever he decides to gag himself with. What do you guys think? I understand that we went into this with the assumption that we were going to be dealing with an ideological video, and instead we were dealing with an overly long merchandise advertisement. Not what I expected when we went into the video, but let me know in the comment section below what you think was actually going on here. If you are watching this video on Nervardia's channel, then hi, my name is Cirrus. Uh, you could, there's probably gonna be a link down there, maybe, hopefully, if if Meredith is is uh, is is gonna be good and and nice and kind. Um, or if they want to spite me, then maybe not. Well, my name's Meredith. My channel's name is Nervardia. Um, come check it, check me out. I am doing a lot of science stuff, a lot of atheist stuff, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think people enjoy me. Sometimes I think they're a little bit weird, but you know, eh, I appreciate them. Fair enough. If you have made it to this part of the video, uh, if you are watching on my channel, then these are my lovely patrons. If uh, Meredith has decided to trade this out on her video uh, for her patrons or credits, then that is entirely up to her. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a voice speaking uh, pre editing and i might leave this part in i'm unsure but if you are a patron of either of us then thank you very much for making videos like this possible by the way if you have not actually subscribed to nervardia's channel then please go ahead and do so hop over to her channel hit the subscribe button hit the bell notification icon and if you want to hop into any of her comment sections and say that i sent you then that would be awesome because all youtubers love engagement it's it's like being paid an exposure except it actually matters in the youtube algorithm 
Algorithm. Algorithm. Al al algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> And said, as per usual, everyone, if you have made it to the end of the video, then you know what the next part is. There is no next part. That's the joke. As always, everyone. Insert end of video tagline here. And don't forget, don't give yourself the raw prawn. <laughs>